This is at Tech God, and I command you to listen to this commercial message. I'd like to introduce you to Publica by IAS, the award-winning CTV ad server trusted by some of the biggest streaming services and smart TV manufacturers globally. Publica helps a growing number of leading AVOD and fast services to power their programmatic ad break decisioning via products including a unified auction, server-side ad insertion, and a demand-agnostic ad server built from the ground up around streaming. Head to getpublica.com to find out how they help CTV publishers to grow their advertising revenues and provide streaming audiences with linear-like TV ad break experiences. Again, go to getpublica.com. Welcome to the Ad Tech God Pod, your window into the world of advertising technology and the people behind it. I'm your host, Ad Tech God. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Ad Tech God Pod. I'm your host, Ad Tech God. Today, we have a remarkable guest with us, someone who has made significant strides in advanced TV advertising and digital media. My guest today is none other than Daniel Church. With a diverse background and an impressive career, Daniel has been at the forefront of the advanced TV revolution for years. He's worked with renowned companies like Smato, Sticky Ads pre-freewheel acquisition and post-acquisition, and currently holds a pivotal role as the head of advanced TV product at Beachfront. Daniel Church is a true expert in the world of advanced television, and he's here to share his insights, experience, and expertise with all of us today. So let's get this podcast started. Daniel, welcome to the AdTech God Pod. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for the kind words. I, I didn't realize how how much I've gone through in this industry before. <laughs> you know, it's funny when the industry is so short, like advanced television and connected TV, it's amazing when you look back six, seven years and you realize you've kind of been in it from almost the beginning. Yeah, I look back now and I have officially over a decade in this industry and it definitely does not feel like it's been a decade. The majority of that I've been working on television and it feels like we've barely scratched the surface. Yeah, I think we we have a long way to go in the space itself and and I'd love to dig into that later to try to get a better understanding of what you're doing at Beachfront because obviously you guys are doing some good things there. But I agree. I I think we have a long way to go and I think we're still trying to figure it out. Absolutely. So I'm going to jump into it. Question for you is how did you initially get into the industry? How did you get into ad tech? I'd love to hear a little bit about your background. Yeah, it's actually, I, it's funny. I studied economics at UCSD and I was all ready to go into the banking sector. I had an internship at a financial firm, but before I got settled into a job, I wanted to go and kind of explore and do some something interesting. So I took an internship with a small app company in Hamburg, Germany. And even though that that went very poorly and actually ended up folding, I found a job at Smato to keep myself in the German ecosystem and to get that visa that I was looking for and fell into ad tech. I didn't expect to be into ad tech, uh, but kind of fell into it working at Smato in the mobile ecosystem. And then after that, you, you jumped into sticky ads, right? Yeah. So I spent about three years in Germany with Smato really kind of got my sea legs, as they say, with ad tech. And then I joined Sticky Ads. Uh, So I moved to Paris. I spent a few months in Paris and then was going to be based in London. But before I really got settled into London, I talked to my boss and she recommended I move to New York. I did. Found out that Free Will was acquiring the little French startup I was working for, and it's becoming Comcast. And so You know, six days after I had that conversation with my boss, I was actually in New York. So wasn't expecting to to end up on on the East Coast, but was able to kind of settle in with Freewheel and and find my kind of my home uh, back in the United States. It's pretty amazing. So you were raised in the US, moved to Germany, then London, then found yourself working at Freewheel in New York City. What brought you to Beachfront? Yeah, I I grew up in San Diego, so I'm American. I I did the European tour, and then, yeah, I joined Beachfront. So, you know, at Freewheel, a lot of changes were happening after the acquisition. I found myself in a a position where I wanted to grow faster than I thought I could grow at Freewheel. 
And so I joined a, a small startup that had just been acquired by some private equity firms, which was Beachfront Media, and was able to kind of work internally at Beachfront to kind of pivot the company in a new direction into the TV side and, and worked to kind of grow that footprint within the, the Beachfront family. Awesome. And obviously, the, the landscape is pretty competitive. You've been there for quite a few years whether at beachfront or you know at freewheel like what are some of the biggest milestones or highlights that you have what do you feel like you're really proud of working at these past companies yeah i'm really proud of what we've done at beachfront you know we've brought a lot of different kinds of tv into the programmatic ecosystem so i i grew up in programmatic i am a child of programmatic i I am completely sold on the mission of programmatic. So, you know, we were able to take a first set top box VOD. So this would be like, you know, if you're on an old school cable box and you select, you want to watch a VOD program and then select something within that menu, we were able to connect those systems to the programmatic ecosystem and do real time bidding directly into those cable systems. That was something that wasn't really done before. You know, Freewheel had done insertions on that inventory, but it wasn't programmatic. And so we were able to bring that into the programmatic ecosystem and make that available to buyers. So that was something I was really proud of. We then went on to linear. So we started tackling the biggest piece of TV inventory available. And we were able to work with the guys over at Dish to kind of make their satellite TV be connected to that real-time bidding. And so Nowadays, you can bid on an inventory on a linear spot, and within two seconds, it's playing out on the TV sets across America. So curious, when, when you talk about moving into more of a programmatic type of offering for, for linear, is it all the inventory that's made available programmatically, or is it just a percentage of the inventory? Is it specific spots or mid-rolls or ads? That's the great thing. The, um, the MVPD or the, the, you know, the inventory owner can actually select what they want to make available programmatically. So it's not that they need to do everything. They can actually choose what kind of inventory to make programmatic. And it's great because they can also scale. So if there's a lot of demand programmatically for this inventory, they can add more into the bucket that goes out to programmatic. And if there's less, they can reserve less inventory for this. Okay. So they still have kind of full control to sell the inventory as they want, but also make it available to I guess, programmatic only buyers if they needed to, or people who are shifting over to programmatic buying. Yeah. And it's important that they retain the ability to control everything within the linear side. What we don't realize in, you know, in the programmatic ecosystem is that this is, (laughs) this is tens of billions of dollars that have been operating pretty seamlessly for the past 30, 40 years. And so change is great to introduce these kind of new capabilities but you know it's a it's a very large boat it doesn't turn very fast and so retaining the ability to to control that inventory is something that was kind of table stakes going forward for these clients yeah i would imagine with that much money on the table that uh, there's some hesitancy and pushback in probably a few years ago are are you feeling like that was probably the biggest challenge was getting buy in from i guess legacy tech legacy television linear television to to move into more of a programmatic world? Would you find that as like one of the biggest challenges? I honestly think that when it comes to the inventory owners or the the MVPDs and programmers, there's actually a lot of appetite for exploring new ways to to monetize inventory. So we saw a lot of engagement from the supply side in, in terms of trying to figure out this new way. But what we didn't expect was so much pushback from the buy side. And I think that that was more so just because of how the different TV buy side teams were actually formatted. So you had the linear guys who had been buying TV for the, again, last 30 or 40 years, the same way through IOs, you know, being able to do direct deals with the publishers and the programmers. And then you had the digital guys who were completely programmatic and audience targeting. And so when we had something that was in the programmatic ecosystem with the digital guys who are used to the audience targeting, that's not audience targeting. You have an issue there. And then when we went to the linear guys and basically said, Hey, 
you know, you can still buy this inventory. It's just made available programmatically. Well, they don't understand the programmatic ecosystem. And so they're not using those tools to actually transact their inventory. So we found ourselves directly in the, I guess, buy side journey of trying to figure out how to structure the TV teams together so that they could seamlessly transact across both types of inventory. And I think we were just very early on originally with that. We're starting to see that change nowadays. I think a lot of these buy side teams are being brought together in ways that are going to facilitate knowledge sharing between those two groups. But it was slow moving in the early days. Yeah, I would imagine. I mean, such an established industry with billions of dollars flowing, processes in place, how they package and sell is basically standardized and, and has become the norm to totally shift into kind of a, a different type of inventory with various data points that maybe they did or didn't have before. I could see how that's that's quite a challenge. So I'm happy you guys uh, pulled through and brought everyone together. Yeah, I mean, there's they're missing out on both sides. You know, on, on CTV, we've always had that kind of audience targeting where you could be very, very specific and get audiences that you want and make that available to your buyers. But what we've been missing on the programmatic side is that broad reach, that you know lower cost of entry inventory that covers a lot of people across the nation. That's been kind of missing from the programmatic ecosystem. And the reverse is true, you know, from the linear side, they haven't had that audience targeting. They've had some addressable inventory that has been available for actually quite some time, but it's not, you know, very targetable like it is in programmatic. You can't you know, find an audience that is 5% of the viewership and target that without paying exorbitant rates. So, you know, both sides need to come together because they each have kind of this different half of the TV pie, and we need to start transacting on those together. Awesome. I learned a lot in four minutes. So thank you, Dan. That's amazing. When when you talk about, I guess, you, your journey and your background moving into advanced television, I mean, the streaming wars are on. I, I've just read something today about Disney, but by the time this podcast is released, it'll be a, a few weeks old. Um, but what direction do you think uh, connected TV, advanced television is moving in and, and where do you see things heading in the next 12 to 24 months? Yeah, honestly, I think this is a super interesting part of our industry. You know, the streaming wars are definitely in full swing. I think everyone is trying to win the war and try to make as much ground as possible. But what you see with Disney and, and Charter with their negotiation is you kind of seeing your return to the linear bundle. I don't know about you, but one of the things that infuriates me the most is I want to watch something. I don't know which platform it's on. And there's, you know, a half a dozen large platforms, probably at least a dozen if you include the smaller platforms. And I don't know where to watch it. I have to Google it every time. And then I have to pay for, you know, these dozen bundles to be able to access all the TV I want. And so somebody like a charter coming in and negotiating with Disney to be able to offer to their customers the ability to access Disney Plus directly from their, you know, new cable bundle, I think is something to keep an eye on because if they can pull all of these different streaming platforms together, into a new linear bundle where I can pay one company the ability to access all of my TV. Ideally, I would be able to figure out a search across all the different platforms so that I could access what I want to. I think we might be seeing the kind of formation of a new linear bundle. It feels like back to the future. I feel like everybody kind of disbanded, launched their own independent apps or channels, did their own distribution across all the platforms like everything possible from Apple television to Roku to web to mobile app to Vizio to every possible channel you can distribute into. And then nobody has really been able to solve the search functionality. I get very frustrated trying to find a channel, being recommended seven different apps that I don't have, figuring out or trying to remember which one I'm actually subscribed to, logging in and sometimes having to research again for that content. I do feel like the return of the bundles here, it's back to the future. I agree with you. I think we're going to see more deals like that charter deal that we saw with Disney. There's more in the pipeline from what I've heard. And so I think, I think it is the right path. I think, you know, keeping it consumer friendly and priced right is, is important. 
And I think the, the, the fatigue of paying for 15 different subscriptions on two different ATM or credit cards every month also becomes a challenge trying to understand what you're still subscribed to and what you're paying. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing kind of the, the return of the bundle. The bundle is actually advantageous for both sides. I know a lot of people are picking up a streaming service, watching whatever show that they want to watch, and then canceling that service. And so, you know, this new bundle would give these, you know, programmers the ability to have that recurring revenue like they did in linear and not have to deal with people cherry picking the streaming services that they're subscribing to at any time. So there's a lot of different reasons to actually bring this TV back together more so even than just the fact that it's annoying to try to figure out where I want to watch and whether it's a rental only on this place or whether it's free or whether I need the live TV subscription or just the normal subscription. You know, there's even multiple tiers within the different platforms. So you might not even have the right tier to access what you're looking for. So I'm looking forward to hopefully the end of of all that kind of craziness. Yeah, I agree. I think think we saw a lot of that in in 2023, we saw subscription numbers start to drop. We saw people kind of cancel subscriptions because everything is monthly. So it's easy, unlike kind of the old school cable, you know, commit to 12 months, 24 month type of programs. And so you saw that churn really kind of scale in 2023, where it was really hard to get that positive subscriber growth across various channels and, and providers. So I'm I'm also looking forward to seeing kind of a reduced churn, improved retention of of customers, and really just simplicity for consumers. I think that's really key. It is quite a challenge to figure out where the content is located. We all now need to become media experts and understand that a specific show was produced by what company. Well, historically, you just turn on channel nine, and you know that on Friday at seven p.m. your favorite show is playing. So I think. Being able to easily search and locate the content, I think, is really important. Hopefully, AI powers some of that, but also just being able to kind of consolidate the packages and make them a little bit simpler for the user. So how do you keep up to date, Daniel? I mean, there's there's so much change all the time. A lot of people have been doing this for what would be considered a long time, seven, eight, nine, 10 years. Some people are new. How do you keep up to date with with the news and trend of what's going on in advanced television and connected TV? Yeah, it's definitely challenging with, you know, so much volume of information. You know, I set up alerts so that I'm alerted every time certain keywords are pulled up in the news. So I can actually see, you know, right off the bat what I'm looking for. But really, there's only so much that you're going to get in the news. A lot of what we're seeing in our industry are press releases that are, you know, reformulated into news articles. So it's good to keep up on what everyone is doing, but there's a lot of fluff in there. You know, if we look at just addressable, how much addressable news has been coming out versus how much addressable is truly available. So there's a lot of buzz around it, but there's not a lot of inventory. So you need to keep an eye on both what people are saying and kind of what is actually being transacted. So it's a lot easier to figure out what people are saying and what is, you know, what is on the top level of the news from these companies, but what's really harder is to figure out what they're actually doing and what's available. And through that, you need to talk to people who are buying that inventory or people on both sides, the buy side and the sale side who have relationships in that area. It's not easy, but you need to keep your ear to the ground. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, even even me, I, I do the same. I have the alerts I created in RSS feed with news just related to the topic that I get emailed to myself. So I scan through it every morning just to see if anything big happened, but it is tough. Like unless your, your ear is on, on the ground, you're listening to everything that's happening with, with partners and and friends and industry kind of publications. It is tough to differentiate what is a press release and what is real news in terms of bringing value to the, to the space. It is tough to kind of differentiate between those two. Any other advice you have for people? Anything new on the horizon for Beachfront you want to share today? Is there a particular direction that you're seeing linear moving in that you think will be beneficial to the space? Yeah. I mean, at, at Beachfront, we're continuing to try to bring disparate TBM points together. We don't see 
the streaming taking over all of TV. I don't think we'll see that for quite some time, but it will take over more and more and more. So it's more important that we have automation with the TV types that are kind of left behind. So we're going to continue to focus on that. I think what we're seeing from an industry perspective is that watermarking, which is this actual thing called a visual watermark, which is actually a bar, it's actually two bars at the top of the screen, they can actually put like a barcode in one or two frames of the actual content. And that can be read by the television to understand exactly what that is and what to do with that information. So the idea here behind watermarking, which is super exciting, is that it doesn't matter where your TV is coming from, whether it's coming from a broadcast feed, whether it's coming from a digital stream, whether it's coming from a DVR or recording of some sort, it will still be able to tell the television that it needs an ad available and then call out and get an ad and replace that back on that television set. So you can overwrite things that you have in broadcast feed. So national ads that you have actually put into the broadcast feed to go out to not just one MVPD, but all of your distribution partners would be able to pick that up and then overwrite on top of that national ad, a digital programmatic ad. So it would allow you to run more digital capable ads with audience targeting on linear spots, but also still have those linear spots where it's not capable of replacing that ad. I think what we're starting to see from the currency providers, the you know the alternative currency providers, even Nielsen is coming out with a lot of products to make this uh, you know more capable is the ability to separate what is replaced and what is not replaced so that those counts can be aggregated together into a whole picture of where the ads played out and how many impressions each one of them got. And you know as we get more advanced kind of measurement there, we're starting to see that unified picture of television start to come together. I think where we see the biggest struggle is probably competitors working with competitors to you know, work to the betterment of the industry. But I think the IAB is playing a pivotal role right now in bringing everyone together to try to push these new standards so that we can actually get everyone pulling the same direction, which is what we need for TV to become truly seamless. Yeah, I actually interviewed uh, Tony right before you. So his his podcast is the one that I launched last week. And I was telling him that the IAB Tech Lab in particular has really done a lot over the last couple of years. I feel like their involvement with really pushing initiatives forward and getting everyone to sit down at a table and talk about what's best for the industry has has been really successful. There were years where I didn't hear much about the IAB, to be honest. But the last couple of years, I, I hear of them and I see them at all the events and I see their participation and drive to help industry kind of leading companies to collaborate has been incredible. So I'm happy that you're working closely with, with Tony and the team. Yeah. In the early days of TV and programmatic, we had that argument of whether it's CTV, OTT, and I was really looking for someone like the IAB to come in and actually dictate what they are because they mean different things. A CTV is a device, OTT is a strategy of distribution. So, you know, it's great to see how far the IAB has come from trying to figure out exactly what the terms mean to now pushing these new standards that actually would grow the addressable footprint of television beyond anything that we have today. So it's been refreshing to see the IAB kind of pick up the torch and kind of bring everyone forward. I agree. Well, Daniel, that, that brings us to the end of the podcast. I wanted to thank you and want to thank Chris, also your CEO, for, for having you on here. I think it's uh, amazing what you guys are doing over at Beachfront, and I hope you guys uh, kill it in the remainder of 2024. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. I'll speak to you soon. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Ad Tech God Pod, a podcast for the people about the people that make Ad Tech great. Stay connected with me for more insights, trends, and interviews in the realm of ad tech. Don't miss out on our latest updates. So follow me on X, Instagram, and connect with me on LinkedIn. Don't forget, ATG Slack community has insights, networking opportunities, and jobs. Keep the conversation going and stay at the forefront of ad tech innovation.